Thanks very much, Julia. And uh, nice to see so many people that can join this event today, even though I can't see all of you today, I can see how many of you there are. So um, if we just move on a few slides to the third slide. So if what, what we're planning to, to run through with you today is a few slides, which we hope will take around 20 to 25 minutes and leave plenty of time for question and answers later on, which I, I'm, I'm sure you're, you, you're got your questions ready already. So we're going to split the, the presentation into three main bits. The first is around our recommended path and the overarching analysis and key messages from the economy wide uh, point of view. Then we've got some detailed slides on, on surface transport, followed by David on aviation and shipping. Um, so if we go move on. So the first slide really shows our approach to the ana analysis and we developed three sort of exploratory scenarios which are shown on this slide in grey. And these span on one axis how far we can go on innovation and on the other how far we think we can go on behaviour change. And as the name suggests, the widespread engagement scenario is one in which people and businesses are more likely to take action on behavior change. And the widespread innovation scenario is testing how far we can go on R&D and innovation and what that implies for cost reductions for many of the top technologies that are being used across the economy. For example, cheap power and how that flows through into um, different sectors. The headwind scenario is where progress is more heavy going. We need to make more of more use of infrastructure and there's more use of hydrogen in buildings and transport in particular. And the tailwind scenario takes an optimistic view of what could happen if we go very quickly or very well on both of these fronts. So it's really exploring the optimistic scenario. And in that scenario, net zero is met, met a bit earlier than the others. So if we, if we go one more slide. So our, our balanced pathway, as we call it, which is the main pathway that we base our recommendations on, cuts across all of these other scenarios. And what we do is we set, we assess what actions are needed across all the sectors and take a balanced view of what can be achieved. So this is really looking at a bottom-up analysis across all the individual sectors and, and setting out what, what, what that means for the economy as a whole. And it aims to keep open the options from the other sectors in play. And crucially, it's what we think is feasible. We use this pathway to make our recommendations. So if we could go on one. An important, I mean, two important points about the balanced scenario is, is that it's consistent with the climate science and what's happening internationally. So it, it keeps open the, the one, one and a half degree uh, global warming ambitions are set out in Paris. It delivers early action, which is important because that's what determines cumulative emissions and ultimately what drives climate outcomes. It results in UK emissions per person in 2035, which are consistent with, with the global pathways to one and a half degrees. And it really shows clear leadership that supports raising global ambition that's needed for Paris. And that, that's really important for the COP presidency next year. It's also a fair contribution in the context of global emissions reduction. It sees UK taking actions earlier than required in global pathways to one and a half degrees. Okay, Owen. Next one, please. Thank you. So what does what does this all mean and what, what are we actually recommending? So this chart shows the path of emissions to net zero in 2050. And the, the sixth carbon bu budget period is shown here as the purple bar. The headline that, that we've set out is that we need to cut emissions by 78% by 2035 on 1990 levels. And that basically means, in effect, bringing forward the, the previous 80% target by nearly 15 years. So, it, you know, it's a, a quite step up in, in, in ambition compared with the previous target. It's important to note that the path is front loaded. It's an inverted S shape with 60% of the reduction happening in the first 15 years from now and 40% in the next in the following 15 years. 
And this, this is really important for investment because most of the investment needs to take place in the next 15 years or so. Uh, basically, in, in order to keep open opportunities that we, that we may not have, that we may need to use, that we've identified in the exploratory scenarios. And our, our recommendation for the, N, ND, for the UK NDC in 2030 is for a 68% reduction. And that in, in excludes the international and aviation shipping sector, which is in line with UN convention. And we're really pleased that the government announced that it's accepted that and agreed to that target. So if we go on, on one. So this slide shows they um, really summarizes the committee's key recommendations for the economy as a whole. Um, the budget level and the 2030 um, and DC we've been through. Um, just to note for, in, in terms of the scope of emissions, we've included all greenhouse gases, including international aviation and shipping and peatland emissions. We're recommending that domestic action should be um, judged on, on, on UK actual emissions. So that's really important with credits only being used where they go beyond the budget level. We're recommending that the, the let the, our recommendation be legislated as soon as possible to give clarity and certainty to business and in individuals and to put in place measures to deliver it because we, you know, we really need to be get, getting on, on with it. And lastly, we, we don't think we need to change existing budgets, um, although you, you know that, that they're below the level required now because the, the UK NDC and the six carbon budget really supersedes those. <clears throat> so that's a, a whistle, whistle stop uh, tour through um, the economy wide level. We'll move now to, to um, looking at surface transport in a bit more detail. So, yeah, this, thanks, Owen. This, this slide shows the balanced pathway in surface transport. And just to note that surface transport is the largest emitting sector currently, it, it, with 22% of total UK greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. And the pathway that we've set out here shows a 70% reduction is required in, in surface transport GHGs by 2035. So it's slightly less ambitious than the economy as a whole. And, but it has a similar inverted S shape. So the next decade or so is going to be really crucial and challenging as the bulk of emissions reduction happens then. Um, our balanced pathway gets to nearly zero emissions by 2050 um, with, with around a, a megaton residual uh, um, left over. Um, and it goes slightly further than we had in our net zero report. So now I'll hand over to Owen, who's going to take you through the key elements needed to deliver this pathway. Thanks, Eva. So on the right-hand side here, you can see the sources of abatement that make up the emissions reduction in our balanced pathway. So at the top there, the sort of purple wedge represents demand reduction. So that's car travel demand reducing by about 9% by 2035 and 17% by 2050. And it's also logistics improvements in HGVs and vans leading to a reduction in miles driven for these sectors as well. In addition, we assume by 2032 that fully electric zero emission vehicles make up 100% of all new car and van sales. An uptake of these vehicles produces the green and the light blue wedges in this chart, leading to about 25 million battery electric cars on the road by 2035. The orange wedge here represents the sales of zero emission heavy goods vehicles, HGVs, which accelerate rapidly during the 2030s, up to almost 100% by the end of that decade. Uh, during this transition, though, it's going to be important still to improve the efficiency of remaining petrol and diesel vehicles, and also to continue to use biofuels effectively, and that's represented by the brown wedge. And then finally, you've got the yellow wedge here, which includes rail, in which diesel trains are removed from all passenger services and from most freight operations by 2040, with zero emission options where possible or hybrid options where not being taken up as the existing stock is replaced. So these contributions then add up, as shown in the chart, to produce the blue 
line representing the emissions under the balanced pathway. But our analysis also did consider various alternative emissions reduction pathways as I ever described. And now I'll move on to what these trajectories look like. So you see on this chart, you've still got the blue line, dark blue line for the balanced pathway. And then you've got these various other exploratory scenarios which we considered. And one striking point about this chart is that the pathways, the trajectories of emissions reduction look quite similar between the different pathways. Uh, there's only about 10 megatons of emissions difference between them by 2035 on a per year basis. Now this similarity is down to the fact that much of the emissions reduction is driven primarily by the phase out of new petrol and diesel cars at some point in the early 2030s. And now that technology and policy commitments are suitably advanced, we can be fairly confident that, that, it, that this is deliverable, which reduces a bit the uncertainty about our trajectories. That said, the similarity of the trajectories does somewhat mask the fact that they get there in quite different ways. So for example, the, the trajectories vary in factors such as the extent of technology choice or the scope for behavioral change. And varying levels of each can, can, can sort of combine to offset each other and give similar, ostensibly similar outcomes. So for example, the widespread engagement scenario, which you can hopefully see in the sort of light green line at the bottom there, uh, that delivers the steepest, the sort of fastest emissions reduction through high levels of public engagement and high levels of demand reduction up to about 34% against baseline by 2050. By contrast, the widespread innovation scenario actually sees demand increasing slightly, and we'll talk more about this in a second. But this, this sort of higher level of demand is partly compensated by faster uptake of electric vehicles due to faster assumed technology development, battery prices coming down faster, etc. Um, so there's sort of potential trade-offs which maybe get us to broadly similar places but in different ways. Um, so next I'm going to take you through some of the key assumptions underpinning our, our analysis of the surface transport sector. So we'll start with demand reduction, and that is the extent to which we can reduce our use of high carbon modes of travel. And this particularly means car mileage reducing with smaller demand reduction con contributions assumed from reductions in van and HGV miles through things like better logistics and consolidation, etc. But the chart here shows the levels of car demand reduction that we assume. And I should note at this point, our demand reduction assumptions are all stated relative to a baseline represented by the black line in this chart, in which car ownership increases in line with kind of government business as usual expectations, that is in line with population and GDP growth. So what that means is potentially there may be some scope to go a bit further in some of our scenarios if it were possible to deliver reductions in car ownership on top of this these levels of per car demand reduction. So our demand reduction scenarios are based on kind of a combination of three factors. So firstly, you've got societal and technological changes, shifts that lead to lower need to travel. So things like increased home working, which we've obviously seen be quite effective in many sectors this year. We would expect some of this benefit to be maintained and things like online shopping. We've also got potential increases in car occupancy, particularly for commuting. There's scope for things like increased car sharing schemes and local initiatives such as high occupancy vehicle lanes, that sort of thing. And finally, you've got modal shifts. So our analysis considered the scope for some shorter journeys switching to cycling and walking and some longer ones to public transport. It's not going to be for every journey, but this can be sort of driven by initiatives that support active travel and improve public, public transport services. So then those three in our balanced pathway combine to reduce total demand, as I said earlier, by 9% by 2035 relative to baseline and 17% by 2050. The widespread engagement scenario explores a world where there's greater scope for demand reduction. It's broadly aligned to the upper end of what the Climate Assembly recommended. By contrast, the widespread innovation scenario, as I said before, actually you can see sees demand slightly above baseline, and that's due to reductions being offset by the advent of connected and autonomous vehicles, uh, 
which could lead to improved utilization of road space and increased mobility, particularly for younger and older age groups. So what you can see is there's quite a wide range of potential demand futures within our scenarios, but it's clear that it's a key factor within our analysis. Um, so moving on from demand, I'll take you through some of the technological uptake trajectories that we assume. So we'll start with cars and vans. Um, so we welcome the government's recent announcement of the 2030 phase out date for new petrol and diesel vehicles. But one point we really want to emphasize is that we believe the role of hybrids in new sales beyond 2030 needs to be minimal. And that's because in real world use, hybrids often drive on petrol power over 50% of the time. So they're not fully sort of zero tailpipe emission vehicles. So over on the right, what you can see is our assumed uptake trajectory in terms of the proportion of all sales that are fully battery electric cars and vans. And across all scenarios, what you can see is that this increases fairly quickly, reaching over 90% by, by 2030 across all of our scenarios. So you can see, as I was saying, our scenarios leave little room there beyond 2030 for new sales of hybrids to play a role. And in fact, by 2032, in our balanced pathway, they are fully phased out and all, all new sales are battery, battery electric vehicles. Uh, what's this mean in terms of overall fleet numbers? Well, we're, we're, uh, our balanced pathway expects about 12 and a half million battery electric cars on the road, which is around a third of the fleet by 2030, and just below 25 million by 2035. And we see this as achievable in part because by 2030, battery electric cars in our analysis are no longer more expensive to purchase upfront than conventional vehicles. And in fact, the greater efficiency they offer means they'll deliver substantial operational cost savings through things like fuel, lower fuel costs, etc. cetera. Um, but of course, to enable this level of uptake, we're gonna need widespread deployment of charging infrastructure. So our scenario, our balanced pathway sees about 280,000 public charge points being installed across the UK by 2030. This is in addition to private charges in people's homes and at workplaces. But most of these public charge points will be around towns to support on street charging for about 30% of premises that don't have access to off street parking and also for opportunity based top up charging. There'll also be about 10,000 in interurban locations such as motorway service stations for rapid recharging during long journeys. Now we think the current level of investment and focus on charging infrastructure is about right, but this needs to continue and we need detailed plans to ensure that we can appropriately leverage private investment and that charge points are always available everywhere that they're needed, not just in particular locations and that infrastructure and network capacity never become barriers to EV take up. So let's come on to heavier duty vehicles. And for them, the roadmap is perhaps a bit less certain at the moment. So up in the top right, you can see three potential decarbonization solutions for HGVs. You've got two forms of electrification and you've got hydrogen vehicles. Now our scenarios are based on some research we commissioned from Element Energy, which considers how uptake of these three technologies might vary depending on the mix of supporting infrastructure and investment that's developed and deployed. And the graph in the bottom right shows the, the, the range of different technology mixes that our scenarios uh, generated in 2035. And you can see there's quite a variety. In the balanced pathway, where we allow the most cost-effective technology mix to be taken up, this results in battery electric being used for many smaller trucks and mainly hydrogen for the larger ones. Uh, but a key message I'd like you to take from this chart is that the, the gray bar representing diesel sales is very small across all scenarios by this point. And this in particular shows that there are various potential pathways by which zero carbon options can become technically suitable for most HGV operations by then. So it's a question of making sure the right plans and incentives are in place to enable this to be delivered. Uh, so to this end, it's good to see funding recently announced for trials of HGV decarbonization technologies. 
and we would emphasize that these need to be these need to be sort of substantial in length and significant in scale to provide a comprehensive assessment of costs, performance, and suitability of the technologies. And these findings then need to be collated and disseminated effectively to help fleet operators understand their options and understand what's suitable for their fleets. We also welcome the plan to consult on a diesel phase out date. Our assessment is that this should be about 2040 but it could be brought earlier if data from the trials suggest this to be feasible. Now in parallel, we'd expect to see a comprehensive plan for how to deliver freight decarbonization. It should include consideration of the infrastructure deployment required and appropriate plans for incentives to ensure that operators can afford to make the switch. That this notwithstanding, of course, diesel vehicles are likely to be on the road a bit longer in this sector than for light duty vehicles. So it's important to support efficiency schemes and to set out ambitious CO2 emission standards. Biofuels will also continue to play an important transitional role, although in the longer term, we continue to view biomass as better used in sectors where it can sequester carbon or where zero carbon options aren't available. So then finally from me, this chart shows, shows the cost impacts of our balanced pathway. And so above the axis, what we have is the total investment cost in each year, which rises to 12 billion pounds per year by 2035. And this includes both public and private investment and both additional costs for purchase of vehicles and the cost of installation of charging infrastructure. And then below the axis, what we have is the cost savings that result. So you can see in the light blue wedge, that this includes substantial savings for car and van users. And this is because our assessment is that EVs will be cost saving to society, so excluding taxes and duties from around 2025. But if you do include taxes and duties, then from a private owner's perspective, the driver could be saving around £500 a year in fuel costs, on top of potentially sizable maintenance savings due to fewer moving parts in electric drivetrains. You've also got large fuel savings through greater efficiency and electrification of trains in the green wedge. And you've got demand reduction and efficiency improvements on the road, which we discussed earlier on the slide about demand. So the key message I'd like you to take from this chart is that from around 2030, the operational cost savings below the axis begin to exceed the in-year investment costs. So what that's telling us is that from this point onwards, the pathway for surface transport is actually cost saving to society. And this is on top of the emissions reduction it delivers and the various other benefits such as health improvements, air quality improvements and reduced congestion. So with that, I'll hand over to David, who's now going to take you through the aviation and shipping scenarios within our analysis. Thanks very much, Owen. Uh, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, aviation first. Um, so I'll talk you through the chart on the left here. Uh, this is uh, emissions from domestic and aviation uh, and international aviation uh, on the left here. Uh, the purple line you see at the bottom there, that's the emissions in our balance pathway for aviation. So that falls to around 23 megatons in 2050 from just under 40 uh, before the pandemic. I'll step through them from the top of that chart. Um, the black line is baseline emissions. So that's essentially business as usual. And what we see there is uh, further increases in aviation demand through to 2050. That's about 65% increase in aviation demand in a business as usual world. Um, and a particularly big jump uh, around 2030 there, which is uh, airport expansion in the Southeast. Uh, so that's business as usual. That's, that's our starting point, but that's not our scenario. Our scenario then for the balanced pathway has uh, three uh, chunks uh, that, that reduce emissions below that. The first of those and the biggest of those is uh, limiting demand increases. So in our balanced pathway, we only have a 25% rather than a 65% uh, growth in aviation demand by 2050. And we don't have that uh, net increase in UK airport capacity. So that's that's relatively smooth. Even with just that, plus the, uh, the business as usual efficiency improvement that's in the baseline, that would take us to around uh, the level of uh, 
uh, emissions that we had before the pandemic. But we then have further uh, aircraft efficiency improvement over and above what's in the baseline, uh, which takes emissions down significantly from there, plus uh, a fraction of uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So that's around 25% in this in this scenario. So that takes us down to, to 23 million tonnes. On the right hand side, we see that the uh, overall the costs uh, for aviation is actually cost saving in this pathway uh, where the the reduced fuel burn because uh, aircraft are more efficient outweighing the higher capital costs of making planes more efficient, plus the extra costs of the sustainable fuels. Point to make here is aviation is not achieving net zero purely within its sector here. So uh, on top of these costs, we then also have to include the cost of greenhouse gas removals to make aviation net zero to balance out those 23 megatons. Uh, in, in 2050. And once you do that, there is a net cost uh, to the, the aviation passengers will have to bear. We we estimate that's around uh, 55 pounds on a return flight to New York. So uh, that that's, you know, you've got some cost saving for the efficiency improvement, but then you're paying for the sustainable fuels and uh, and for the greenhouse gas removals to, to make aviation net zero. Okay, Owen, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so we, we then have a, a wide range of scenarios and you will see uh, quite quite uh, quite a broad range here. Um, I'll start on the right-hand chart to explain what's going on here. So this, this is aviation demand. Uh, as I said, the, the baseline is uh, business as usual, 65% growth in aviation demand. Moving down from that, we have the innovation scenario that is more like a 50% increase in aviation demand consistent with the top end of the climate assembly uh, range that was considered acceptable there and that's continued really on uh, big technological improvements both in aircraft efficiency but also then on the sustainable fuels uh, to, to power those those aircraft um, moving downwards from that we have the headwind scenario that that only has a 25% increase in demand by 2050, but it does have the net increase in airport capacity, uh, which means it does have that jump, as does the innovation scenario uh, in the early 2030s relating to in increased airport capacity. We then have the balanced pathway, which gets to the same point as headwinds, but, but in a more uh, in, in a smoother way without that net increase in capacity. And the bottom one here is both for the uh, the widespread engagement scenario and for the tailwind scenario, they have the same demand assumption, which is actually for a 15% reduction uh, in aviation demand compared to uh, pre-pandemic levels. So those feed through then into emissions on the left-hand side here, we see um, not only demand, but then also use of sustainable fuels and, uh, and, and efficiency improvements uh, to come out with, with emissions. We see that headwinds, um, because it has a, a relatively uh, low use of sustainable fuels and relatively low uh, efficiency improvement has the highest emissions there, uh, followed by headwinds. The really interesting story here, though, I think is the widespread engagement and widespread innovation scenarios, which get to about the same level as 2050 emissions, but through very different ways. So uh, in the engagement one, we have the lower demand, actually lower demand than we have today but more modest use of sustainable fuels, 25% uh, use of, of sustainable fuels and uh, more modest efficiency improvements. In, in the innovation scenario, demand is considerably higher, but we have more efficient aircraft and we have 50% uh, sustainable fuels in that scenario. But interesting that they get to the, the same level of emissions in 2050. And then the tailwind scenario, which is kind of how low can emissions go and how rapidly can we get to net zero, we combine the best of those two previous scenarios that I was talking about. So we have the lower demand as in the engagement scenario, but the also the, the better technological improvements to aircraft efficiency uh, as in the innovation scenario, and also the same volume of sustainable fuels as in that scenario. In tailwinds, that volume of fuels in the innovation scenario is enough to push out almost all fossil fuels by 2050 in tailwinds. So that gets us almost to uh, to zero absolute emissions in, in aviation and very little then greenhouse gas removal needed to offset that. Okay, that's a quick tour through our aviation scenarios. I'll come back to talk about policy in a minute. Owen, can you move on the slide? Uh, so we'll talk about shipping scenarios now. 
Okay, so it's quite a different story in shipping. Um, the chart on the left here again shows uh, our balanced pathway and what we see here is that most of the heavy lifting in decarbonizing the shipping sector is through use of sustainable fuels, zero carbon fuels, which we've assumed to be uh, low carbon ammonia uh, produced both in the UK and, and overseas. Um, we assume that that can decarbonize almost all the shipping um, and with a relatively small role for, for ongoing efficiency improvements over and above business as usual. On the right hand side, we see the different scenarios uh, that we have and really they get to the same endpoint and the difference is, is only about the timing. The balanced pathway has a relatively uh, gradual deployment of ammonia uh, over the period 2030 to 2050. Um, the tailwind scenario and the innovation scenario is, is more front loaded, where most of that happens in the 2030s uh, in terms of rollout of ammonia, both for new ships and retrofit of, of ammonia to existing ships. And the widespread engagement uh, scenario uh, has it more back end in most of that happening in the 2040s. But broadly speaking, they all get to the same uh, endpoint. It's, it's only a, a matter of uh, how quickly they get there. OK, next slide, please. Okay, and the, the, the last thing to say on shipping scenarios is we think there's a net cost here because we think that uh, low carbon ammonia will be more expensive than the, uh, than the high carbon fuels that we use today in shipping and the impact of further efficiency will be relatively small on overall costs. So there is a net cost here, but it's not huge. Finally, Owen, do you mind moving us to the recommendation side? Okay, so... Uh, First of all, um, we have recommended that international aviation and international shipping should be included formally within the scope of the sixth carbon budget uh, and the 2050 net zero target. Um, so far, they've been kind of allowed for formally outside the targets, but allowed for um, in setting the level of targets for other uh, sectors. But we think now is the right time to formally include those. That's not about the UK taking a, a unilateral policy approach to aviation and shipping uh, just because it's in the targets. It's about taking responsibility for those emissions. So we still think that it's appropriate if ways can be found to for international action uh, on a multilateral basis to tackle aviation and shipping emissions in the right way, um, that that's the right approach. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't have them in UK targets and take responsibility for those emissions. And if necessary, if emissions are too high in aviation and shipping, uh, reduce emissions by more in the other sectors. Um, so that, that's our recommendation there. For the NDC, you'll see that the UK has now uh, agreed uh, to our recommendation for a 68% reduction in UK emissions by 2030, excluding emissions for international aviation and shipping. But we said as part of our recommendation that should be alongside uh, tackling those uh, emissions from those sectors. We recommended it on that basis because that's the convention for, for NDCs. And finally, on non-CO2 effects and primarily in, in aviation, um, we recommend that those are not directly included in, in carbon budgets through a, a multiplier, for example, um, because the science does not support that as a robust way of, of uh, estimating the contribution to, to climate change, uh, that those are not equivalent to, uh, to, to tackling uh, CO2 emissions. Um, you can't have a metric that, that uh, treats them on, on an equivalent basis. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't tackle them. We absolutely should be tackling the non-CO2 impacts of, uh, of aviation, but not in a way that is at the expense of increasing CO2 emissions. So we shouldn't be taking longer routes, for example, to, uh, to, to avoid non-CO2 impacts, if that means burning more fuel and higher CO2 emissions. But we do recommend that there's a minimum goal, uh, that there should be no additional aviation uh, non-CO2 warming beyond 2050. And we will be monitoring uh, aviation non-CO2 uh, in our annual progress reports to Parliament. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Back to you, Julia.